Hey there viewers, thank you for tuning in to Super Mario Diagnostics once again. Today we are going to diagnose a no crank no start on a 2009 Mercedes C300. Alright fellas, uh, first things first, started my pre-scan, got my uh, hazard lights on and we're going to see what happens when we insert the key, does anything light up, does anything happen at all. Uh, and um, this is really to address Mercedes DAS systems. Uh, there's, uh, I get a lot of questions actually about these systems and how to diagnose them or how to find out if it's a key, if it's the ignition lock, um, the EIS, or if it's the steering lock or any of the other things that could uh, cause a uh, inhibited crank event like the engine computer and things like that. Um, we've got the key we press the button and you can hear the locks work the dash just lit up right now on its own when I press that button let's see what happens when we stick the key inside nothing changes let's turn it to the first position nothing changes turn it to the second position nothing changes I've got my pre-scan running and while that's going we're gonna just recreate it again maybe we could get this thing uh, this cluster to shut off um, some some pointers that I give uh, those who reach out to me is what does the cluster say what does it do when you insert the key in our case it does absolutely nothing what turned on the cluster was the remotes uh, functions and whatnot so but in a lot of cases you could tell whether the key is good or not by uh, sticking it in and the cluster will usually tell you to remove key you know once you if, if you're a Mercedes owner you're pretty used to when you turn off your vehicle it asks you to remove your key so that you don't leave it inside the vehicle when you walk away one of the other things you can look out for is whether or not the um, cluster turns on that's actually a big deal uh, usually when you insert the key cluster should turn on immediately and give you some kind of a message if it doesn't turn on um, I don't automatically assume it's a steering lock because everything happens right here first this is the first step here and uh, once the EIS clears it gives the terminal 15 on to the steering lock and then it has to pass through the steering lock before it could turn on terminal 15 to everything else so the fact that it's not turning on I, I can't even think about looking at the steering lock until we get this in order. So it's going to be one of these two. It's either going to be a key or an EIS. So that's where my pre-scan comes into play because I want to scan, make sure I can communicate with the EIS. One of the ways you can find out if the EIS is good or not, or at least reading, transmitting here, is by sticking a, a bad key a lot of locksmiths out there have a bunch of keys and it'll, they'll stick in a key that's not written to the vehicle and it'll say please remove key but since we have nothing happening here it makes me wonder whether it is recognizing the key at all and uh, the presence of a key or anything like that because the fact that the cluster doesn't come on um it makes me wonder if it just doesn't know that a key has been inserted. This button, this little slide right here doesn't really act as a, uh, I don't think that's wired to anything. Uh, so that's just there to protect it from dust. But I don't think it actually does anything. What, what actually does uh, start this up is, is radio waves, uh, radio frequencies. So we've got our pre-scan going. Let's go ahead and take a look at our pre-scan. A lot of people think that... Um, Scanners will tell you everything. Let's see if that's the case. Let's see if the machine can tell us what's wrong. We've got low pressure fuel circuit to low, tire pressure monitor stuff, front SAMP. So front SAM is uh, a lamp faulty, S windscreen wiper motor is faulty, actuator is blocked, rear SAM is another lamp, a fuel pump control module. An internal fault exists in the fuel pump control module. Well, we'll deal with that if uh, we get this thing at least cranking. Roof system, actuator motor is faulty, and right front door central locking motor is faulty. There's a short circuit to ground, apparently. None of these 
tell me anything uh, to address my problem. So the codes are of no use to us. And for the general public, if you're watching, if you go to AutoZone or any of that stuff, if you actually tow your Mercedes to AutoZone and get them to read this, uh, these codes, they have a code reader. They're not going to read into all of these modules. And the one that you want to be looking at is the ignition lock. So let's go into uh, ignition lock. Electronic ignition lock. They call it the EZS. That's just another name for an EIS as well. Uh, we want to look at live data. We didn't, we didn't have any codes in here. But why would it throw any codes if the key was a problem? So, um, If there was a weak battery, sure. But if it's, a if it's a key that's just not transmitting anything, it might not wake it up. It might not wake up anything. So let's look at live data. And maybe we could get a hint as to what's wrong here. Terminal statuses, we don't, we know. Well, you know what? Why not? I guess everything's off, right? We put the key in, we turn it to the second position. It's, it recognizes that it's in position, so the EIS is obviously communicating well. Transmitter key in position 15, not active. So let's see if it'll recognize cranking. There you go, it does. Actually, it did. It doesn't. Terminal 50 is our cranking, and it doesn't change. But that is only a confirmation of the cranking signal being uh, emitted. So that tells us something there. We know our power supply is good, otherwise we wouldn't be talking to this EIS. Uh, I don't have a maintainer on it right now. I know I, uh, I'm the first one to say that I put a maintainer on everything, but... Uh, this, uh, yeah, you caught me. <laughs> so, these are basic um, settings for the EIS being adapted to the vehicle. So, we, it needs to be personalized, it needs to be initialized, it needs to be activated. All of these are saying yes, that's good. What we need to look at is here is a valid key identified? No no valid key is identified so we have two options we can either test the key or if you don't have a way to test the key you can ask the customer for a second key and i did i reached out to a customer the customer to make sure that all the keys are present so we're, we're in the process of getting all the keys present that's usually what we how we like to handle um cranking situations um and and, and things like that so of course we need a key first before we can get start enable to the steering lock and then we need the steering lock to be enabled the start enabled in order for the control the uh, engine control module uh, to give the command as well and the transmission as well so the transmission is also a part of the uh, the DAS system on this one it's part of the immobilizer so yeah I hope that helps a lot in diagnosing uh, let's see if we could test this key. I know there was another little tip that I could give on this. Usually when it's your steering lock, your cluster will turn on, all of the gauges will turn on, and it just won't crank. So that tells you that the key is good, or else we would be having this situation. That tells you that the EIS is good because, well, it, it's turning on the cluster, and that there's something finally in the way you would have to look at live data you could take a look at live data in the EIS in order to find out if it's passing through the uh, electronic steering lock uh, before it gets to the engine computer so if you have the everything good up to the steering lock and your engine computer um, shows not enabled then there may be something inhibiting cranking on your ECM if you do see yes well then you may have to look at the starter circuit that goes through the front SAM, if I'm not mistaken. That's like a purple and white wire. You're going to have to look for command there. Once you prove command there, well, then you're likely looking at a starter. But don't guess. Test first. Let's go ahead and see if we could test this key using the IM608. All right, so we've got our programmer here. That is what we're going to use in order to test the key. We're going to have to get out of here out of the diagnostics and go into the immobilizer. I do apologize for the glare. 
Um, you know what? <laughs> let's just go ahead and turn off some lights. And let's go back. And since it's a little darker, let's go back again. I'm going to take off that uh, filter. Go to MO. Hit accept. And a lot of people like to just test the key generically. I don't like to do that. Um, I rather go into the brand and test it that way. Go to expert. You go to key. And we should be able to see IR. Put in the key. Read key information. Press OK. And see if it reads anything. I'm going to see if I can get another Mercedes key, show you what it's supposed to look like. I may have one nearby, actually. Failed to read key information. Let's go ahead and um, see if it will identify the uh, frequency. So, going to hit unlock. It re the the radio the frequency portion of it the uh, remote portion of it is fine the issue is the IR so yes you can have a working remote doesn't necessarily mean that everything is good with the key and we could open these or we could just replace the key if it is easy enough to open I will probably try to but this one looks like it may not have been opened before not a hundred percent on that but anyway you know I've repaired Mercedes key be keys before and usually it's like a messed up or like a, a cold solder joint or uh, maybe the, the key was dropped and something came loose in there I don't hear anything but uh, you'd be surprised sometimes you could uh, reflow the NEC chip and it'll fix it so we're gonna see first though if the customer has any keys any other keys just to confirm the repair before we dig into the options as to what the repair is gonna be they may opt to just stick with the other key and move on with their lives or they may decide to repair this one which it's unlikely but some customers you know they decide to offer that it has its own price <laughs> and then some customers want to go ahead and add a brand new key which we can do as well so we're gonna await approval and get right back to you guys so I decided to open up the key and we've got the key fully disassembled and out and I think I may have found what the issue is let's go under the microscope and take a look so underneath the microscope we've got the IR if we take a look, let me just focus in a little more. And that is the best I could do. I cannot stop shaking because it is under a magnification. It's pretty hard to uh, keep this thing perfectly still. Video does not do justice. I do apologize for that. But that's exactly how I found this. It was lifted. And check that out now is it is it readily apparent that there's a contact issue I, I'd say so that's supposed to be pretty solid on there we do have some donor boards this is supposed to be right there like that we do have some donor boards we could uh, transfer uh, transfer the IR portion of it over and see if it fixes it Sorry for the dirty nails. <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna get some crap for that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I don't see anything else that's uh, super obvious. I looked it over. Don't see anything crazy. It looks like a pretty good looking chip. Like it doesn't look... Um, overly corroded we got very minor corrosion going on nothing that I would worry about personally 
But anywho, I would be surprised. Uh, you know what? I may put this back in the programmer just like that, just to see if it'll then read. And um, I pushed it back down. We're going to hold it back in place and try to read it again. <laughs> and it reads. Wow. You know, I could just reflow this. I think I could reflow this and be perfectly fine. I kid you not. Um, this must have been dropped. This key must have been dropped. Uh, this should take very little time to just fix. I think I will do that. The thing is, it's such a small chip that the heat transfer is ridiculous. I may have to protect the rest of the circuit board in order to give it heat only right there. Let's see. I'm going to reflow this off camera and uh, go back to the vehicle. <coughs> All right. So we've got our key put back together. Our remote works. Yep. Our remote works. Our cluster still turns on. I still have my hazard lights on. Let's put in the key and see what it says. Extrae la llave. That means remove the key. Just as we spoke about earlier, this is a good sign. I have full confidence that this thing will crank. Will it run? I have no idea because we didn't know how it ran before. But the radio was on in Spanish. Um, all the lights are on. Let's go ahead and crank this thing. Battery was a little low, but it starts and runs. And it's giving me codes for lights and whatnot. So we did offer the customer uh, the option to add a key. And he said, you know what? If you can repair it, go ahead. If a key must be added, go ahead as well. Um, don't drop your, <laughs> Don't throw these keys around. <laughs> these things are expensive. Uh, if you own a Mercedes, don't just throw them around. Do not do that. <laughs> if you work in a shop and your coworker asks you, hey, pass me that key, don't launch it across the shop. This is what happens. And if you can't fix it, it's going to cost you a pretty penny. Um, the customer is paying, you know, us for the job. And um, it's not cheap, but it's a still a lot cheaper than replacing a key, doing an all keys loss uh, job. It, which is the most expensive kind of key job you can do on any car is the all keys lost because he didn't have another key so um what's the point of the video the point of the video was to show how to diagnose uh dash related systems and in this case it was a key in another case it may be something else but um and to show that uh yeah throwing your key around and, and being uh, accidents do happen, but being reckless is usually the case here. Uh, we've seen um, plenty of times where uh, you know people just chuck them. And so be careful with your keys. Uh, hope this was useful information, and um, don't take this as a silver bullet. If you're watching this and you think you're going to walk into a shop and say, "Hey, listen, this guy just opened up the key and did this and that," and you expect a shop to just do that for you. Um, that's not normal. Uh, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back at all i'm just telling you right now that most shops would not even open a key and most locksmiths won't even open up a key unless they had to transfer an nec chip or something like that but uh, i think that with the shortages that are happening and that are coming uh, we're gonna have to get good at repairing stuff instead of just replacing the e-waste is a real thing uh, look into that <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going off on a whole tangent there. That, that's like a whole different direction. Um, <laughs> thanks for watching. Appreciate you all for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe. If I earned your subscription, be sure to let me know um, in the comment section. What do you think? What did I miss? Um, of course, we'll always recommend another key just in case something happens. This, this is not a good idea to just have one key in a car. Uh, for a car it's a really bad idea always have at least two keys for every car that you own thanks again uh take care until next time